you so much, Manny. Thank you, uh, very kind introduction. Manny and I were both uh, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, students uh, at the same program in uh, Paris-Saclay called Cachan, ENS de Cachan. So, so great. Uh, we, we saw each other not too often uh, in between, but it's always good to see you. And thank you so much for being here on an early uh, uh, rainy Thursday afternoon. What else can you do, right? But uh, come inside and listen to someone who's going to try to explain the articulation. Oh, it's a very personal vision, I guess, of uh, how uh, neuroscience has contributed to AI as we know it today and how uh, AI can help with you know, current neuroscience research and vice versa uh, as a virtuous circle. I'm going to try to use my phone as a remote. It's a big premiere. So um, yes, the idea is to um, together to take a journey and to look at uh, where, uh, you know, where we can uh, see neuroscience and AI interact as disciplines, as m you know, different methods, different questions. Where is the overlap? Actually, if you are here today, um, that's because you're interested in this little guy and maybe you're interested in this other little person uh, or maybe a different organ, but you're interested in this interaction between somewhat biology and, and, uh, and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these kind of tools. And, but if I go back specifically to, to the brain, so if you come from the brain perspective, so there are many open questions. You know, we know n a lot about... Uh, uh, about the brain at different scales, spatial and temporal, uh, different mechanisms, uh, different methodology to study the brain, but there are so many open questions and uh, hard problems that remain. Um, on the robot side, um, you know, the models and the implementation of a certain form of artifi artificial intelligence, as we will see, has been inspired by uh, what we think uh, we knew about neuroscience back in the 50s or 60s, and in very much, uh, you know, to a very much, uh, to a very large extent, they took, actually, they are now, AI specialists are now, you know, developing their own approach to, um, you know, emulating brain networks uh, in uh, deep neural uh, architectures and all the uh, related uh, approaches to, to machine learning. But there are still, you know, uh, uh, big questions regarding the interface between the two and opportunities to actually have uh, cross-pollination between uh, the multiple disciplines that cover neuroscience and multiple disciplines interested in, in AI. So I'm going to try to clarify that. One bridge from uh, basically the machine to the brain is to um, you know, stimulate specific uh, regions of the brain with specific uh, stimulation programs, if you will so that you can uh, uh, alleviate the seizure onset or the onset of seizures in epilepsy. You can maybe boost, uh, you know, certain cognitive functions. Um, maybe one day we're going to have brain implants and um, to help us in our old age, but also to maybe learn a new language. Who knows? Uh, on the other side, of course, there is a major, major research vein that goes from the brain to the machine, and that's brain-machine interface. That's one, uh, you know, uh, possibility there. But more broadly, uh, we, uh, I'm personally interested in looking at both worlds to um, better understand behavior or the symptoms of complex disease, uh, essentially the disease that are conveyed in neurology and, and mental health and maybe look at the possibility to use AI, as we said yesterday during the discussion, for personalized diagnostic, but also intervention. But also we may want to use neuroscience to have you know, more adequate models uh, and more adequate forms and grounded forms uh, for artificial intelligence. So understand better also neural computation. How can we transfer from what we think we know today in 2023 about brain circuits and how they compute to maybe optimize uh, in a way, um, have more energy efficient, for instance, implementations of, of artificial intelligence. Um, so, but I think uh, it's important uh, as a discussion today to look into, um, to define the term terminology because we are manipulating very broad concepts. So. Um, we can look at neuroscience as the, uh, the goal of neuroscience. It's to understand the nature of us as humans, what makes us uh, so human. Uh, so what's the nature of the human self? So that's a very broad question. Uh, but as often, you know, it's good to look at uh, art to take a little bit of distance 
uh, before we go back to science. And um, we could cite many examples, but I like this example from this contemporary artist, Lee Ufan, who's a Korean <laughs> painter who spent most of his career in uh, Japan. And the reason I'm, I'm citing him today is because he's he has a very, very, uh, you know, uh, something that resonated with myself in how he sees, you know, a perception and how he sees his work in uh, his environment uh, and his environment and our environment is nature. And of course, for artists, perception is very key. And um, so what he says is that basically, I'm going to quote him uh, verbatim, nature is not an absolute truth in the sense that we reconstruct it permanently. Uh, perpetually with our physical senses. So basically our perception, our constructions from our, from our own mind, which is a combination of the physical senses with some representation we have of our environment. And so the way he puts that into practice is that he needs to feel a certain resonance between nature, uh, his environment and his work. And basically uh, this resonance, he feels uh, it through his breathing meaning that when he starts painting, for instance, um, and when he feels that his breathing dynamics uh, stop being aligned with nature's flux, whatever that means to him, but uh, probably we have all different representations <coughs> of what it means, this physical flux we get from nature's signals, it is time for me to end my workday. So what I'm trying to say and what, I'm gon what we're going to see together now in the next uh, few slides is how we can actually um, uh, you know, look into this as, um, you know, uh, as a, a defining feature of, uh, of a living organism, just like us, as humans, but also uh, probably animals, and how this makes us different so far of artificial intelligence, and how we can maybe in, uh, involve, you know, what we think we know about how the brain and the rest of our bodies implement this kind of, you know, sensation, high-level sensation, uh, to make uh, artificial systems maybe more intelligent or uh, more humans, more human. So for that, we need to look into biological versus artificial intelligence. What makes it similar? What makes it uh, um, different? So we've seen many of these graphs, I think, or equivalent of these boxes uh, over the past uh, few uh, presentations. So this is a representation, among many others, of deep neural uh, architectures or convolutional neural networks, whatever, we won't go into details. But these basically architectures have been inspired, as you probably know already, by, again, biological neural networks as we find uh, in the brain. So the a form of hierarchy in how the processing of information in the brain is relayed from one region to the next, or even within one region of the cortex, you have several layers, basically, with different kinds of cells that are interconnected locally and globally, so that uh, a form of deep neural processing is occurring. So there are salient differences, of course, even though they are, you know, cross, uh, there's been a lot of inspiration initially from here to there. Um, so what it does, basically, what artificial neural networks do to work is basically a form of learning from large, large, large amounts of data to produce human-like or at least human-useful outputs. Um, the large language models today, as we mentioned yesterday, I think, are you know, very greedy. They need a lot of parameters to be tuned, and uh, there is no you know, limit in sight uh, in how many parameters uh, can be uh, implemented and, uh, you know, and finely tuned for ever-growing uh, sophistication in the function. So we're talking about billions and billions, hundreds of billions of parameters. They can learn relatively fast, um, and they can generate new um, material, uh, images, language, etc. Uh, they are very expensive to run because, again, these are, they require an immense uh, amount of data, but also a lot of informatics infrastructure. So they are, uh, you know, money and energy greedy. So some people say that uh, for JetGPT, either for training or just running it, it's a budget of about $100,000 per day, if not more. Who knows? Just for the informatics infrastructure. Um, if you look at the brain, so indeed it has inspired early artificial neural networks for um, AI, or at least machine learning. 
There are many parameters also in the brain. Uh, we are looking at about 80 billion neurons, but what is important is not only the neurons, but how they interconnect with each other. And if you look at those synaptic contacts, we are looking at more like one, one million uh, uh, billion, uh, uh, 1,000 billion, so one trillion um, synapses. And for each synapse, you have a weight uh, and many other parameters. So you're looking at uh, you know, a highly flexible kind of system. Uh, we are very capable of uh, one shot and uh, more often few shot learning. So yes, you show an image of a cat to your little to your little nephew, and within you know maybe looking at the picture of the cat, maybe one or two times they know that this other animal in the in the in the field is uh, or outside is also a cat, even if they look different different color, etc. It's very compact, it's transportable, and very energy efficient, of course. And very importantly, um, what differs for now, but we are very close, we have an artificial system to make them <laughs> autonomous. But even if they are autonomous, they can play video games, for instance, by themselves. They can maybe even elaborate complex process, uh, pipelines of operations, etc. There is no notion of autonomy. For instance, ChatGPT is not looking for paying his, its own electricity bills, for instance. Whereas this person here, uh, that's one of the major issues that they are facing. They need to eat every day, they need to have shelter and make sure they are safe. And that's one of the major, you know, uh, motivation for most of us in different shapes and forms. Uh, and that makes basically human intelligence in that respect, at least directed and motivated uh, by different goals than artificial intelligence. So we'll come back to that. So. Yeah, I prepared some of these slides like six months ago and they, I was looking at them again yesterday and some of them feel already old. But um, I, what I think we need to, before we go into the neuroscience, I think it's important to realize that there is staggering, accelerating progress or at least advances, technological advances in uh, generative AI. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's why we were talking about a revolution yesterday and in it has you know, been disruptive, transformative and it's going to continue to be disruptive to what we do every day as scientists and engineers and technologists but also for uh, everyone else in the society. So whether we like it or not. So of course we mentioned many times the large language models so you may have interacted already with um, ChatGPT or other forms of this of large language models in, in, in disguise, like the chatbots from you know, the support line on websites, etc. Very often before you speak to a real human, you're gonna speak to Kevin, and Kevin is, a, is an instance of ChatGPT or, or similar. But basically, uh, so maybe we can just skip that, but basically there are many, many you know, uh, tasks that can be now handled uh, seamlessly, uh, almost, by uh, these large language models, and they can be used even beyond language. They can actually code, they can generate images, they can generate music, sounds of different kinds. Um, for instance, we are in a biomedical uh, conference, so there is, uh, we mentioned also, I think, the other day, the, the idea of uh, helping or developing assistance to doctors, some people have played, you know, with uh, instances of uh, large language models they trained on the medical literature. So they trained a chat GPT or equivalent model on the entire open access literature from PubMed. Uh, so 110 gigabyte of text, which is a lot of information. But when you think about it, it's a relatively small volume of uh, data in terms of storage. Um, so they trained the system over several days, and after that, they took, uh, they had it take basically the basic medical exams. Uh, you've seen that, I'm sure, example in the press. And basically, what happened is that even with a relatively light uh, system, you see, so they compared it to Galactica, which was another competitor for medical uh, uh, artificial assistance. Uh, with 120 uh, billion parameters, and that's another thing. The efficiency is also one goal of those, uh, you know, artificial systems and the developers. And the PubMed GPT had only three billion parameters, and yet it was overperforming the the bigger ones. So progress every day in not only how they these systems do, but how efficiently they how efficient they become uh, in terms of again greediness. 
Um, so yeah, these scores basically, uh, you know, uh, are those that are um, that take that could take you, you know, to medical school in the U.S., for instance, as an entrance exam. There is also the notion of generative AI and systems for, uh, you know, imaging and um, imaging in the sense of creating images. So one of the early applications where was the um, uh, an image enhancement, and we mentioned that in radiology uh, as apps, you know, available to doctors these days. So this is a portrait of Geoffrey Hinton, which is one of the godfathers, as people say, of the um, of uh, deep learning. And so we start from a low resolution image of that person, and from that low Im uh, image resolution, we uh, enhance the image through generative AI. So. Initially, some of these systems have been used to denoise, uh, you know, some of the images. Of, I mean, images. But now uh, you can also reverse the system and actually start from noise and generate a high-resolution image or version, or denoise version of the of the information. Um, 2021, 2022. So this is an eternity. <laughs> it's like a year ago, but. Uh, it's uh, it's an eternity at the pace of uh, you know the advances we see in the field, but I think one breakthrough was from Google Labs, or uh, yes, where they basically released Imagen, where um, basically you enter some text that describes an image you would like to see creating, and so uh, that's exactly what the system does. So you need you use natural language. And uh, often, you know, people enter some silly prompts just to try to, you know, uh, catch or uh, um, to, to have the system fail. But often, you know, this is a brain flying on a rocket, so this is completely silly. But still, Imagine is, ab is, is able to generate something that matches the, the, the prompt. And uh, you see that more and more for useful applications these days. Uh, and today, you know, you have Midjourney, DALI, um, this is version 2, and now we have version 3, stable diffusion, etc. Uh, you can create videos, etc., uh, using just natural speech. So the breakthrough was really, uh, in terms of natural language uh, conversation, was uh, indeed ChatGPT, just for the reason that it was released to the public. To the dismay of many people you know, in the industry and society, so like Google and Facebook, they had their own language models, but they were reluctant to release them because of the, you know, instability uh, in the conversation, to say the least. But uh, OpenAI decided to go completely, uh, you know, not opening the code. Uh, that's not what I mean. But they released uh, ChatGPT as an app accessible to everyone, to some extent. So it has created a lot of commotion in the media, as you know. This is examples just in, uh, I would say, just in India, but that's 1.4 billion people, because I gave this, uh, one of some of these uh, slides and talk uh, in India earlier this year. But everywhere in the media, including here in France and Europe, the rest of Europe, of course, and everywhere in the world, there was this realization that something was happening. So because we are in a biomedical uh, imaging workshop, I uh, used ChatGPT and I asked it to basically uh, create or elaborate on uh, biomedical imaging. And I asked it to basically write an introduction uh, uh, about orthonormal cerebral retinographic imaging, which is, I think, something that does not exist, to my knowledge. But uh, ChatGPT was actually extremely uh, totally able to generate a paragraph that I could probably copy and paste and post in my uh, news piece if I'm a journalist or if I'm, uh, you know, uh, an influencer on social media, I could just create that uh, easily. And uh, this is something that makes sense. So it says that it's a, it's a combination basically of MRI and uh, computed tomography to create detailed image of the brain and the retina, which by itself is uh, very interesting, I think. And so, okay, I uh, prompted ChatGPT to give me some citations because I want to elaborate, you know, uh, and make sure that my piece, uh, news piece, is uh, credible. And actually, uh, it created and gave me some references about orthonormal cerebral retinographic imaging with the link. Uh, the names of authors were a bit suspicious, John Doe and Jane Doe, but, you know, 
it may happen, I guess. But the, the others were actually quite credible. There was one in, uh, in the British Medical Journal. Uh, there was one, uh, there was even a, a review of recent developments in orthonormal cerebral <laughs> retinographic imaging by Emily Thompson and Matthew Rodriguez. I went to verify, and so the DOI, so the, the link to the paper did not exist uh, because it was all made up, as you, as you understood. But I, I didn't want to stop there, and uh, basically I used table diffusion to create images of orthonormal retinography. I cannot even pronounce it, <laughs> so OCI. Um, so, okay, give me some images of OCI, and it created beautiful images, which, uh, some of which resemble some of the most beautiful images that uh, our colleagues uh, showed earlier in the week. This one is beautiful OCI image, another OCI image. This one is particularly uh, beautiful, maybe, and looks very scientific, right? And I didn't want to stop there because I really wanted to give this talk on OCI today and re reveal to the world my new technology. So, okay, give me an example of the instrument. And it looks like an OCI. I don't know what you think, but that's a cool OCI device. It looks portable, and I guess uh, doctors could use it at the bedside. This one looks like more like maybe uh, the space capsule. Uh, and this one is kind of ugly looking, but that's okay. But uh, you see, so it's fun, but you can imagine, you know, some of the issues that uh, artificial intelligence, as it stands today, uh, can also be used to, here it's just, uh, you know, we're joking around with uh, biomedical technology, but it could be, uh, you know, political manipulation. You've heard that in the news, I don't need to explain. So we need to, to be careful about how uh, we can use this powerful tool. If we go back to the notion of AI as the I in the AI, which is the intelligence factor, so th again, that was probably a year ago, so the general intelligence quotient, whatever that means, to of ChatGPT, probably ChatGPT3 here, I don't know about ChatGPT4, but if you ask it to, test, to take the test, it's, uh, it reaches a quotient, a score of 83, which is not so bad. I mean, um, um, the, uh, the average would be what, around 100? So 83 is a bit lower than average, but it's not totally dumb, right? And so you can have this notion of uh, this getting somewhat intelligent, as uh, we uh, understand it from a human perspective, which, is, which brings us to uh, the Turing test, right? So would ChatGPT pass the Turing test? Um, so Turing test was elaborated by Alan Turing and colleague back in the 50s when, uh, with the emergence of computers and informatics. So Turing was a visionary in many aspects, including of how, you know, he, he could foresee, I think I have a quote here, that uh, he could foresee even at the time, 100 years ago almost, that, you know, computers may become, uh, you know, as intelligent as humans. And so therefore we need to develop a test to assess whether, you know, the level of intelligence, so to speak, or human-like intelligence for computers. And so the test, if I, uh, you know, boil it down to the substance, is that uh, you have a, a machine, you have a human, and then you have another human behind a wall, and this human is interacting with either of the two uh, agents through language. And so uh, maybe the robot is sending a message to the human, and then the human needs to assess whether it was sent by the computer or by the human. So I'm, I'm sure you've heard about it before. So you know, it's quite li uh, limited because, again, it's limited to human-like intelligence. But with generative AI and new systems of AI, we might face a form of intelligence that we don't understand. So we are, it's, it sounds like science fiction, but actually it's becoming more science than fiction. And who knows whether we're going to be able to understand, you know, the, the logic and what we are exposed to with these advanced uh, artificial agents, agents. But just for the sake of the discussion and the rest of the, my talk, I would like to stick to the Turing test. And I came across uh, you know, an interesting publication, I think from Stanford, where they wanted to elaborate a minimal Turing test you know, by crowd uh, sourcing, if you will, um, uh, a sample of the population to, instead of having one single human assessing if that, that is artificial or this is a human agent, so you ask, basically, you're going to pool uh, um, here a thousand participants, and you ask each participant to, you know, 
designate a word that would convince a judge that you are human. So if you want to send a message to uh, someone and you cannot interact with that person directly, face to face, but through just maybe a text message, and you need to send only one word to that person to convince that person that you are a human, not a robot, what would be that word? So they ask 1,000 persons about those things, and this is the word cloud, if you will. Um, so it's very interesting to see some people say, this is love, this is soul, this is uh, boulevard, I don't know why you would say boulevard, desire, emotion, imagination, humanity. So the things that I think relate to you know, emotions, uh, spirituality, etc. But there was a very big cluster, and actually the biggest cluster a uh, semantic cluster where profanities and bodily functions. So you would say, I'm trying not to... <laughs> so any form of onom onomatopoeia, you, you see, no body, body uh, like, uh, uh, or fart, uh, penis, uh, poop, etc. Uh, so that was uh, the biggest semantic cluster. And if you think about it, yeah, that makes sense. You know, that relates to the, the thing I was saying at the... At the or what Lee Erfen was saying, as the, the painter, was saying with much more beautiful language and, and uh, you know, relation to nature, but that brings us closest to our nature as a biological agent. And then there is a second uh, thing in the test, so now this, this is the Turing test itself, so now you, um, you once they have this cluster, the, the entire cluster of the, I don't know how many hundreds words that were the most cited, by the human uh, samples, uh, they uh, basically uh, showed paired pairs of such words. So it was, you know, a, a rather higher bar in the competition, meaning that you would pair words that were voted as already the most uh, distinctive of uh, human um, uh, human uh, beings, if you will, and you present two of such words to another set of human raters, and then they need to decide uh, which is the most likely to be from a human. So for instance, uh, it could be um, love and emotion, it could be uh, uh, religion and boulevard, etc. And you, somebody else decides, okay, the boulevard, that must be human. And there, are, there is a winner, there is a word at the end of the day that is voted the most, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the most uh, human-like, and that's the word poop. So if you show someone, if you, have, if you receive a text message from, some, from something uh, that says poop, and then it's probably human who sent it uh, your, this te text message. So if you pair poop with love, people will say, oh, well that's some, the, person, the, the agent who sent me the word poop is, the, is definitely human. Love could be a, a, a computer that tries to trick me. Anyway, but so it's a, a bit on the light side of things, but I think it has very interesting implications about okay how we uh, how we perceive you know our humanity. So it's related really to also not only you know highest forms of compassion, emotions, and relations to nature, but relations to nature in the most basic sense also through our body. So it refers to bodily functions and it also evokes, you know, jokes of very different kinds. So that's very much what makes us human to a large extent, I'm sorry to say. So uh, there is another area of tech progress that is also very interesting from a neuroscience perspective, uh, at least. So AI, I think, concerns everyone today, whether we like it or not. But for the neuroscience side of things and Actually, in all your respective fields, we've seen beautiful talks about the cutting-edge technology for brain, uh, sorry, for heart and for uh, chest, uh, you know, scans, etc., of different kinds. So that this is brain plugins. So this is basically, you know, um, collecting data from the brain at uh, at scales that are un unprecedented, but also stimulating the brain. So we see, you know, an increasing uh, volume of neurodata. So in basic neuroscience, these are these implantable uh, probes. And again, it's coming from the industry. Uh, we are seeing that most of the large models in uh, deep learning are now generated by industry with a lot of, you know, questioning about many things uh, beyond just the nature of this AI, but access and cost, etc and transparency, but that's also a little bit the case uh, for the technology, and this is um, 
Neuralink, which is a spin-off, or a spin-off. It's uh, one of the startups by Elon Musk. And they created this super high-density probe. It's uh, the little ha hairs that we see on the picture that sit directly onto uh, the brain tissue. So they can integrate about 3,000 uh, electrodes. Uh, it can be uh, implanted very quickly by a robot, uh, not on a human for now, but uh, on uh, they, they use the rodents uh, models, but also uh, non-human primates. And so the robot can uh, implant almost 200 electrodes per minute. And so, and it's highly portable and very energy efficient. At the end of the day, you end up having, you know, a high degree of integration and portability. There is even a USB-C connector. And so this is not Elon Musk, but um, he said, he claimed, among the many things that he claims, that he would be, uh, you know, implanted with one of these implants whenever it's cleared for safety for humans. So we'll see. But, you know, you, for a neuroscientist, it's, uh, it's been a game changer. They've been using this kind of systems for many years, of course, but uh, not to that degree of integration and portability and affordability also. So that's very interesting because at the end of the day, um, you end up having, uh, you know, also applications uh, for patients, uh, things that really transform people's lives. And I'm just extracting some articles from the New York Times over the past two, three years. And so the, this person, for instance, has regained some control of his paralyzed hand through a uh, deep brain or uh, stimulation of the motor system. Um, this is another um, demonstration. For now, this is more like proof of concepts, but you know, depending on where you stimulate and how you stimulate the brain, you can also boost certain higher functions beyond motor functions. So we're talking here about improving memory uh, this person, I'm not sure what, I, what it had, but a traumatic brain injury and some form of recovery uh, using brain stimulation. Severe depression, there are clinical trials that uh, uh, can help people with, uh, look at how we could help uh, people get out of their recurrent and chronic depressions in severe forms. Of course, there is this uh, amazing you know, ther therapy for Parkinson's, you probably have seen that, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson, and it works, and this is part of the clinical, you know, uh, toolkit for the doctors and their patients. But now it's, it starts, what I'm trying to say is that it starts, you know, uh, changing lives and changing the perspective on how we can act on the brain using machines, basically, to uh, change higher forms of cognition beyond just motor skills and motor command, which is uh, already extremely uh, spectacular. This is a recent example by the team based in uh, Grenoble at Clinatech, where they built this exoskeleton uh, for this person who's a tetraplegic, so cannot move their arm, cannot move their legs, and basically they drive uh, virtually the, the exoskeleton with brain implants. So they put some of these uh, Neuralink-like implants even though it's a different technology, same principle, over the motor cortex of the person, and he was able to some extent to drive his exoskeleton. By the way, they use pre-surgical mapping with some of the tools we develop in the lab. We were not associated with the publication, but uh, just a, a shameless plug for the things we do in the lab uh, for, for pre-surgical mapping through functional imaging. This most recent, actually, it's from this year, I think it's from a team in Switzerland, where they also use, uh, you see, um, pre-surgical brain mapping with the tools we develop in, in my lab to again map the sensory motor cortex of uh, a person who was a paraplegic. And this time it's uh, yet another tour de force. They have the brain implants, but also a spine implant. So the brain implants record brain activity in real time using wireless technology. The person has a backpack inside. There is a, all the you know, computing power that, is, uh, that process the brain data and decode the brain data and sends the signal to the spinal cord of the person be below the lesion that caused the paraplegia, and that person was able to walk and, and, and climb stairs, etc. So this is, you know, today slash the future, and this is, uh, you know, a, a fantastic way to look at uh, how... So here artificial intelligence is more like machine learning because it's decoding brain signals in real time interpreting those brain signals into meaningful motor commands that are then issued by another set of electrodes to the body. 
So the approach uh, currently is to uh, use, I mean, a, a major, major uh, use of um, AI slash machine learning in neuroscience is through, like I said, the decoding of complex brain signals, especially through very dense arrays of recordings, hundreds if not thousands of signals that are spit out, you know, uh, every millisecond or even faster. And you need to take a decision about what, what's happening you know, at every time point. And if you want to interface with a machine or back to the body, you really need to have this uh, food chain, so to speak, between the body and back to the, s to the brain. And often, you know, the technology inside is based on machine learning. So you have a library of things you want the human person uh, to achieve from the brain signals. So one way of doing it is actually to train an artificial system to learn from the brain signals of that person or a different one through motor imagery or actual motor commands uh, and then generalize to that person so that uh, they can read from the brain signals, interpret the intention of the person and then interface with the machine. In that sense, in that case here, it's an exoskeleton, but it could be you know, other things. Um, yes, so it, bo it goes both, you know, both ways, the reading and the writing to the brain. So the problem is, I mean, there are many problems, of course, but uh, it's also very exciting. Uh, the main problem for now is that it's invasive, uh, this intervention to the brain, uh, but it's also very agnostic of the neurophysiological mechanisms. So meaning, can we go just beyond decoding things for relatively simple commands? Because if we are able to interpret the neural signals more in a more holistic fashion, in a more, um, you know, deep, in a deeper fashion, we can also achieve probably more fine-tuned and more, um, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, intentions of the person. Um, and also, the where do you implant, right? So for motor commands, it's relatively clear that you will implant in the sensory motor system. Uh, but that's very broad, so you know, even that is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, a given. But also for cognitive functions, where are you going to implant to boost the memory of a person who is, uh, you know, declining cognitively? Uh, where, and if we project ourselves in the, in the future, if you want to learn a new language, where are you going to plug that implant? Um, is it one location, several locations, etc.? So one of the things we are looking at in the lab is to basically advance the basic mechanisms of neuros neuroscience, you know, uh, systems. And for that, we try to use a, a, a theoretical framework that considers the brain and the body. Uh, even for cognitive functions and perception, it's important to uh, realign the brain with the body uh, functions and capabilities and work at the appropriate time scale. So what, I'm, uh, what I mean by that is that, uh, again, if... Um, this association between brain, the body, the physical senses, and the environment, it's uh, not only, you know, what we learn from artists, but if we look a little bit inside ourselves, that's exactly, you know, what we do all the time as a, as a biological form of intelligence, so to speak. So the idea of this unbodied self, it's not something recent. It's actually a long intellectual journey from many philosophers. Uh, Husserl uh, described basically the, um, the experience or the, con the form of consciousness, the, the, the idea of being feeling the experience of oneself as a phenomenon that can be described. So that's, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, an important statement. And then you have Merleau-Ponty who has made the connection more explicitly uh, of the consciousness of oneself uh, with the body of the same person. Of course, I'm simplifying, um, but uh, a very important thinker is uh, Hans Jonas, who has actually put forward the notion that not only do we live in a body, but this body, you know, you need to take care of it, and it has limited uh, capacity. So, and one key notion is the notion of metabolism, and metabolism in is an integral part of uh, human intelligence and, and animal intelligence in general. And uh, like I was saying, uh, you know, uh, this form of intelligence and our capacities come with the cost and the concern that we need to maintain their safety and their uh, ability. So we need to uh, basically care about our autonomy, which is not, again, uh, uh, a concern yet for artificial systems. Um, 
and I was lucky when I was in Paris to interact a little bit with Francisco Varela, who has, uh, you know, enunciated these notions into the inaction principle and looked at how neuroscience could actually, you know, uh, make testable some of these notions and concepts um, of um, neurophenomenology, basically. So, like I said, the current AI systems are kind of disembodied, right? We interact through text, and it's more like a chatbot. Yes, you know, uh, um, there are fantastic progress, and we can do many things with that, and may maybe we're going to leave it at that, but if we are concerned about artificial intelligence, it's uh, already a different form of intelligence in the sense that um, it, it has no common sense, and the common sense often is related, again, how to keep us safe, how to keep us autonomous, and how to make us navigate a complex world. So if you look at the, the issues with the self-driving car, you know, it has made a lot of progress, but it's not yet a turnkey, so to speak, uh, system available to everyone. There are many, many concerns about safety, responsibility, liability for the passengers and the car themselves, but for the environment as well. Um, so uh, I'm very curious to keep an eye on how, you know, how this is uh, evolving, especially with robotics and uh, interaction with artificial environments like uh, video gaming, uh, because it's evolving very fast. But for now, we are not yet at a level where you know, the, 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 the artificial intelligence system is probably conscious of its own finitude and, uh, and uh, challenges. So yes. Um, I pretend to be a, a neuroscientist, uh, so I'm interested in the brain, but uh, I'm also, con you know, there's a growing realization that the brain lives in a body. That sounds silly to say, but that's, uh, you know, more essential than we had thought uh, in recent years. So there are more and more neuroscientists we, who are looking, for instance, at interaction between brain and heart. So this is where some of you who work in the heart business you know, there's, there's a connection here with what we try to do with the brain. So, uh, for instance, every time you have a heartbeat, there is a response from the brain, from the electrical activity of the brain, that is, uh, you know, responding or, if you will, uh, uh, correlated, associated with heartbeats. And, uh, and um, you know, this and, f and subsequent studies have shown that it modulates also our vigilance, for instance, and our ability to process external signals. But uh, if we go even deeper, there are, you know, there's, uh, there are neurons that are connected to the guts also. Uh, so there is this gut-brain axis hypothesis, which is still, you know, very much of an exploratory, in an exploratory phase. But there are, you know, um, hypotheses that may relate, uh, you know, uh, higher cognitive function, but also dysfunctions with uh, early onset or manifestations and mechanisms that take place in the gut. So the microbiome, the, and the microbiome being defined by what we eat and by how we interact with our environment in many respects. So this is a very important, with no pun intended, axis of research. Um, so there, there is also beautiful work by Catherine Talon-Baudry and colleagues in France and, and elsewhere that looks at how you know, very slow fluctuations in the rhythm of uh, digestion and the guts can also modulate higher cognitive functions like perception and uh, memory and uh, attention. Um, I'm going to skip this. So if we are interested as neuroscientists or if we want to understand whether an artificial system is conscious and to what degree, for humans at least, we cannot put that question outside and consider the brain as living outside the body. So uh, consciousness has many you know, definitions, but we could look at it from a perspective of the embodied experience of oneself. So it's already in the wording here, so it's embodied in the sense that we it's... it's uh, someone in a body or a self in a body and the body is important not only you know to preserve autonomy and um, and uh, the, the integrity if you will of the person um, so that it continues to live it's also uh, something that we use all the time to interact with our environment so we can make complex changes to our environment to meet certain goals so yes i can reach to that apple in the tree but I can also plant a new apple tree to get more apples. So that's an example, of course. Um, 
And this has been, you know, from a neuroscience perspective, this, this has been, or even psychological uh, perspective, this is not a new idea either. So we looked in the previous slide as philosophers who've looked at, you know, um, how you at the embodied experience uh, of, a, of a conscious being, but uh, also how we interact with the environment and even how perceptions are forged by uh, our uh, brain and body systems. It's something that was enunciated very early by von Helmholtz, one of the inventors of uh, modern psychology, and has been, you know, revisited many times, as often in science, uh, by different, you know, neuroscientists these times, who look at perception as an active process. Remember Liu Fan, the artist, who was telling us that from his perspective, he constantly reconstructs and invents uh, the rea reality, what he sees. It's basically a, a permanent confrontation between what his senses are sending him and what, uh, you know, the internal representation of the world uh, he makes of it, out of it. I'm looking at the time, so yeah. So what I would like to propose is now to bring those things together and show you now some data, finally, and how we can approach these complex questions. So. Uh, let me uh, enunciate a simple proposition, at least simple uh, in, in appearance, is that complex behavior manifests with an active uh, and constant interaction between the brain and the body. So what I mean by body here is a very general sense, and that includes, of course, our physical senses, but also other things, how we interact with the environment through motor actions, etc. So... Um, the problem is that we need to face an evolutionary or ecological challenge is that we need to base decisions. So shall I, you know, get that apple in the tree? Shall I plant a new tree, apple tree? Based on very incomplete information. So we can be very proud of our physical senses, you know, our vision, audition, etc. But they are very limited, very incomplete. Uh, so we only have, a, a, what I mean by that, a very incomplete representation of the physical world at every given instant uh, in front of us. And when I say this, it's also behind us, right? Here I'm talking to you, but uh, because I know that behind me there is no you know, burning lava or there is no hole where I could fall at any time, or there's very little chance that the, the floor would collapse, uh, you know, I hope, uh, under my feet. So um, I have this very limited knowledge, but I can reconstruct, you know, what's behind me and feel safe, etc. And uh, and uh, but that's you know that's exactly what we do all the time without being even conscious of it. But that's an important um, uh, solution that evolution has found, which is to help us basically reconstruct in our mind a limited and imperfect representation of our environment, so that we can basically travel through it and live through it and actually also uh, improve it eventually. So how does it work? Uh, for that, we're going to look at the, we're going to go back to the brain and look at the hierarchy of these deep different layers of the brain. I'm not talking necessarily about the layers of the cortex, but as a general sense, as in circuits and network in the brain, which, has, which are viewed as uh, hierarchically organized. So what does it mean? It means that uh, you have sets of regions at different scales, but at the micro scales, what the recent brain imaging uh, discoveries have shown, that we do have, you know, big regions and sets of regions that are, you know, named unimodal cortex or unimodal brain, in the sense that they are essentially wired to receive sensory, basic, basic, not so basic, but early, you know, physical inputs from the external world. And if you look elsewhere in the brain and somewhat intertwined uh, anatomically with those regions are higher order transmodal cortex, more related to higher brain functions. But of course, I this is a very simplistic view, uh, not necessarily new, but uh, demonstrated again at many diff using different technologies, different approaches um, at different scales. What is interesting is the interaction, of course, within the blue regions, within the green regions, but also between. So we understand that sensory regions would send signals to the higher order decision-making regions, for instance. But uh, what is less, you know, um, commonplace, maybe, is to consider that uh, there is actually even greater wiring of the circuitry of the brain back 
from the higher order cognitive brain regions to the sensory regions. If you look at the visual cortex from an anatomical perspective, 20% of the cables, if you will, the white fibers, the axons that uh, are within, you know, connected to the visual cortex, connect the visual cortex to higher order brain regions. 80% are uh, um, cables that come from the higher order brain regions back to the visual system. So our visual system is fed constantly by, you know, internal representations and signals, at least, that informed it from inside, not so much from outside. And this is how you may explain, for instance, the, some form of visual hallucinations or of fear of the dark. If you are left with no visual input, what's left, you know, to your visual system are internal inputs which are fed by you know, internal mental representation, cultural representations of, you know, being alone in the dark. And usually, culturally and historically, it has, it's never been a good thing. And so, therefore, you, you develop this fear of the dark because you lack the physical input, right? So, let's uh, look into a little bit of jargon. And again, this is a vein of research, and I'm looking uh, now at a relatively narrow uh, at it with a narrow focus based on how we approach it in the lab and with colleagues. But again, uh, the, the, the naming and wording might differ, but the ideas are the same. So the idea indeed is that if you have an input, let's say from the external world, let's say a visual input, it's going to reach what we call primary input regions, so the primary visual system or primary auditory system. But immediately afterwards, it's going to be relayed across, you know, these brain networks, preferentially along the blue highway, to reach eventually higher order brain networks. But it's going to go there directly or through dynamical relays, like the thalamus, like other cortical regions that act <laughs> like a hub, like airport hubs, uh, hubs or metro system hubs, you know, uh, to make the communication more efficient. But eventually, it's going to reach basically the rest of the brain. And like I said, for the visual cortex, but it's true for all the blue regions in the brain, there is a big, heavy green highway that comes back to the visual system, auditory systems, motor systems, from these higher order brain regions. And so in our jargon, just to go quickly, the blue highway is the bottom up from a hierarchical perspective, from the low, um, you know, low order brain regions to higher order brain regions. And the green highway is the top down uh, information, if you will, a processing uh, communication channel. And what we think is happening is that the top-down projections, which are so, uh, you know, uh, effective in the human brain and also mammalian brains, issue contextual, contextual predictions. Okay, I'm alone in the dark, what's going to happen to me? You remember these horror movies, you remember many stories you heard as a child that you should be afraid in the dark and you try to make sense of what you hear and it doesn't make sense and you get afraid, for instance. So you issue contextual predictions. And what the lower order brain regions, what we think they do is that essentially they compute a difference between what you expect and what you actually receive from the external world. So when the inputs are very low informative, um, or when you have these uh, auditory inputs in the dark with this, uh, you know, chicken that is walking on the roof, uh, immediately you think it's a monster of different of, of some kind, and um, so the error is too great between what you expect and what you are hearing. But in a normal situation, like here, I know. I think that there is no hole uh, behind me and I can safely move around the stage. Um, so this is important because we can look at, you know, not only perception this way, but also higher order brain uh, behavior, complex behavior. What's going to happen is that the brain wants constantly to minimize the error between, again, uh, the predictions of the input and the actual physic physical input it receives. So you can adapt your behavior. If you are hungry, you can grab a, an apple and you are not hungry anymore. And therefore, the error signal between your guts and the brain is minimized. But you can also sell your apple on the market and get money. And maybe that was your goal and good for you. So you see, you can, by minimizing the error constantly, this is something that you can generalize to actually elaborate very complex uh, behavior. 
you can also learn that this apple is not a good apple and you shouldn't plant the seed to get the same apple again. You should try something else. And this is something that through learning, you can also look at it as an error minimizing um, approach and strategy. So how can we now move from the boxology representation that I've been using so far to uh, you know, imaging, finally, because that's what we are for. Um, so we can use different techniques. And back into the 17th century, you know, there was this early idea that you could put someone maybe uh, in that system and get uh, basically a representation or l liberate that person from the, you know, the, the complex uh, thoughts and uh, demons that, uh, that they had in their mind. So today, of course, we look at the brain from many different ways. And I'm using this uh, shameless plug to uh, actually uh, indicate that uh, we have released with Bradislav Mizic, also at McGill, the Neuromaps uh, toolbox that uh, help you basically use uh, the wealth of data that is available from the community to project uh, basically the microstructure. It could be uh, different uh, expressions of different brain rhythms. It could be uh, atlases of receptors and genomic types uh, onto the brain um, so that you have all these atlases available uh, to compare to your population. Uh, to your patients, etc., and see where in the brain certain effects that you detect in your data align with the genomics, align with the receptors and transmitters, etc. So yes, we can look at the brain from many, many perspectives using PET, MRI, as we heard yesterday and, and two days ago, and, but also electrophysiology. So talking about electrophysiology, which is something we haven't heard of uh, you know, in this workshop so far, for the reason that it's not considered as an imaging, um, um, imaging uh, technology, but I'm going to try to demonstrate you can do imaging with electrophysiology anyway. Uh, what happens is that you measure the brain in real time. So you remember the implants I was showing from Neuralink. You can do that in the brain also non-invasively with EEG, with magnetoencephalography and other technologies. And you have this very dense real-time millisecond scale measurement of uh, electrophysiological activity, which is the activity of the cells, the brain cells, essentially the neuro <coughs> neural assemblies. And what is uh, really important, uh, why it's, I think it's still a technology that matters, is because you can work at the real-time of the brain, but also the real-time of behavior. And there is uh, relatively easy ways to interface in real-time electrophysiology with stimulation, for instance. Or imagine that at this red line time point, I have a brain decoder and I'm, I'm uh, able to decode basically some you know, thoughts of interest from the person that I'm monitoring to help them walk again or actually see again, this kind of things, depending on the environment. So how we do it is that eventually you can have these kind of images. I will explain how. So we bring in the T1 MRI from uh, the participant, and then we measure electrophysiological activity at the broad uh, spatial scale and the very fine time scale. And this is real time uh, activity from the brain uh, during the resting state of a person with eyes open, etc. So you see that it's highly complex. It's very dynamic. It's uh, moving all the time, but there is some structure in there, just like in fMRI, just like in PET. Things don't move around just randomly, even though just looking at it, it looks like total randomness, but you see spatial correlations, you see patterns that repeat, just for the good reason that this brain activity is expressed, even at rest or instantiated by brain networks that are uh, highly organized. So you can look into this, uh, and I'm particularly interested in how this complex brain activity relates to complex behavior and complex symptoms, as I said. So how does it work? Well, you have brain, uh, this is a little cell here, a neuron, and every time there is a, this neuron is actually uh, constantly bombarding at its synapse, uh, by, um, at its dendrites, by you know, incoming signals from uh, neurons uh, in its neighborhood or even from long distance. And whenever, you know, there is this imbalance, uh, I mean, sorry, this uh, synaptic activity creates an electrical imbalance between the apical dendrites and the cell body. 
So even if the, 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 the neuron is not discharging, is not active, the electrical activity at that site, in terms of incoming brain um, neural activity versus the response, creates a disequilibrium uh, imbalance in electrical charges, and that creates a virtual uh, current. Um, and every time you have a current, there is a magnetic induction. So first of all, yeah, there is an electrical potential that you can measure uh, through voltage differences with EEG, even at some distance. But something that is less known is that it creates a magnetic field, and that's the induction lines that are drawn around the neuron. And if you place a sensitive enough magnetometer, like uh, a coil, you can measure the current that is induced by the magnetic field or magnetic induction. So again, beautiful physics in action, because even though the principle is very simple, you can realize that the sensitivity is extremely uh, challenging because the currents are very small. So we need to look at circuits of different sizes. So we think that for postsynaptic potentials, so with no discharge, we are looking at several tens of thousands of cells, so uh, several millimeter cu cubes of synchronized neurons. The action potentials are much stronger, so we might need less synchronization to uh, detect some of it. So, but th there is some signal that we can measure outside the brain, thanks to uh, beautiful instrumentation using quantum physics, so quantum detectors of currents. Uh, that are embedded into this system. So this is a magnetoencephalograph, or MEG, with uh, several hundreds of sensors around the head, but they are in a rigid helmet. You don't need to put them on the brain. And it's very quiet. It's a relatively open environment. You can have a caregiver next to the child or the patient. So that's uh, much more quiet and enabling than an uh, MRI scanner. You can do concurrent EEG or even intracranial EEG together with the MEG. Um, you can use it upright, you can use it supine, you can do anesthesia, you can do sleep studies in the same instrument. And now there is new technology coming in with a radically different physical principles for the sensors based on uh, pumped magnetometry. And it looks more like uh, EEG, as you can see, it's also much cheaper to operate. So, but continues to have the beautiful uh, spatial resolution of, uh, of MEG. So uh, the idea is that indeed you have this little <coughs> red current that is activated, for instance, in the auditory cortex of that person. And then uh, if there is activity there, it's going to create these yellow lines, which are the volume currents that circulate in the brain tissues through the skull and through the scalp. And if you put electrodes, you measure <coughs> the, e the EEG. But you can also measure the green induction lines, and that's MEG, it's the same principle. I'm just repeating what I was trying to say before. This is the MEG sensors. And if you model the biophysics of the brain, the geometry, the conductivity of the different tissues, you can predict what are the currents that have generated the signals that I was showing you, the all the time series that you need to decode. Now you uh, can also be more anatomically specific and maybe decode the activity that is happening in the motor cortex, if that's your interest. I'm going to skip this. So I get the question all the time, and it's a good question. How oh, it compares with uh, EEG, where it's very similar in principle, but the sensitivity is much better for MEG than EEG, especially if you do some imaging or image reconstruction, uh, as I was explaining a moment ago, using inverse problems, inverse modeling. Uh, the, the spatial resolution of MEG is much better and less sensitive to the geometry of the head and the conductivity of the tissues. So the method has been uh, validated with depth recordings. Remember, we can do uh, depth recordings also during MEG in uh, volunteers, uh, I mean, epileptic patient volunteers who have implanted electrodes for therapeutic, um, not therapeutic, but uh, exploration where of where the seizure is coming from in their head. So these are the little brown sticks that get into the brain of that person and you measure the electrical activity very specifically around each electrode. I'm going to show you in a moment. And the blue and red are the magnetic fields at a certain time point measured with MEG while the person is inside the scanner. So if you play the game of getting into the brain of the person, you see the brown stick and the green cylinders are the contact points, which are the actual electrodes that measure the local brain activity. Another game that is interesting to play for validation perspe perspective is that you get whatever signal you measure 
at a certain location in that person's brain, the green line, with whatever you estimate from the orange clusters at that time point and over time that you get from the non-invasive recordings projected onto the person's brain. And you want to see, of course, the green curve correlate with the uh, white curve because this is uh, green is a ground truth and the white is the prediction from the imaging model. So this is what we did, and uh, this is uh, you know, a relatively short period of time, just for illustration, and this is, a, this is a spike that happens in the posterior temporal occipital region of that person. Uh, the red is the invasive ground truth, and the blue is the prediction from non-invasive imaging, and the time scale is in milliseconds. So 300 milliseconds, and you see with the naked eye the uh, nice correlation. It's not perfect, but you get the strong peak signal and a few other details. And now we pick another electrode, more on the temporal lateral side of the person. You see the dynamics are very similar. The correlation is still very good. And now we're going to go deeper into the brain, uh, reaching the hippocampus eventually of the region. You see the dynamics are changing slightly or radically and the blue curve continues to follow the red curve. So this is a form of validation of the non-invasive imaging. You can do many things with this technology because of the wealth of the uh, data that you are measuring, not only in space, but uh, also in time. So you can look at the data, the time series of activity, millisecond by millisecond. You can look at it in the spectral domain, slow frequencies, high frequencies, interactions of different kinds. So one of the big limitations of MEG is actually the complexity of the signals that you get, which is uh, multiplied as you project it on the brain because of the coverage of the entire brain surface. So it's a good problem, but it's a problem. Uh, let's go back now to our you know, uh, existential question, and let's go back also to this idea of we have these boxes and how does it translate now in terms of brain activity? Uh, meaning that we need to question which mechanism may implement the concepts or principles I have put forward uh, before of the hierarchical networks. So let's move from that box to another set of representations. So now I'm not going to use little blobs or little boxes, uh, but more circuits. And so at the local, regional uh, scale, basically what you get is a constant interaction between excitatory and fast and slow inhibitory cells. And this is basically what we can define at the local circuit of computation in the brain. And when you observe you know, how it behaves spontaneously, just to simplify a little bit, there is this... Um, both simple and complex uh, 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 manifestation, if you will, or generation of uh, slow currents and faster currents, so slow activity, fast activity. So with the Greek letters we use in electrophysiology, we designate different frequency bands. So delta alpha is slower than gamma. And you see that on average there is this form of modulation uh, of the blue currents, which are very fast, like burst acti bursting activity by the slow activity. This is a phenomenon of phase amplitude coupling that is being observed, you know, at different scales, different preparations from slices to animal models to uh, in vivo in humans, etc. And these neural circuits basically are pretty much the same. Of course, I'm oversimplifying. And I'm sorry for that, but the idea is always the same, that you have these interactions between excitatory circuits, inhibitory cells, trying to compete with each other and help each other. And the net product of that, from you know, some distance, is this interaction between the red curve, which, is, which signals a certain level of excitation inhibition, and blue bursts that occur preferentially at certain phases in time. This is all interconnected. And then you have the green guys, and uh, so the green guys are the, the, you know, the channels that uh, we think uh, you know, are the green highways that relay the internal representations from higher order regions to lower order regions, both locally and across the brain. And we believe, and others uh, believe, and there is evidence for that, that it's conveyed by beta uh, activity, which is in the range of 15 to 35 hertz in the human brain. 
So how we think we work, it works. Remember that this circuitry tries to minimize its error, especially the error between an external input and an internal input there. But the, uh, this is true for this guy here. It's receiving some internal input here from this relay or that circuit directly. And there might be you know, internal representations on the genus to that circuit or from other circuits uh, that uh, we don't know about. And it's also trying to minimize its uh, error. So one way of doing this, if we actually uh, expand the scale of this elementary circuit, is that you have the net inhibition of that circuit that is represented by the red <coughs> curve, and you have these gamma bursts that are nested at certain phases, not necessarily the trough, but here we look at the trough. And then you have an input. And remember that the error needs to be minimized, and it will be minimized if we predict correctly when and what will uh, the input consist of. Okay, and when it will occur. So if it's unpredicted, what's going to happen is that it may happen, this un unexpected or unpredicted input may happen at a time when the circuit is in an inhibition phase. I forgot to mention that this oscillation basically between more excitatory, more exciting versus more inhibited state is one manifestation of metabolism. It's one manifestation of the integrity and the maintenance of the function of this regional circuit, which is also concerned by its own you know, virtual bodily function, meaning that it has to go through certain phases of inhibition to be able to recharge, basically, or maintain the metabolism of the cells so that they continue to function. They cannot stay at a constant state or level of a certain excitation to be ready to receive inputs and process them, there is a price to pay that uh, uh, impose that these circuits need to go into a phase of higher inhibition so that, again, the metabolism locally can be refreshed and can be maintained, I should say. So I talked about it at the you know, whole individual level, but it's also true of the little parts that constitute uh, basically, uh, for instance, brain circuits. So if, if the uh, input is unpredicted, like there is a, a dog that is barking behind me, and if it's happening at a moment where my inputs, auditory inputs are more inhibited, relatively speaking, it's going to create a very large error. Because if I register this input, yes, I will. I will uh, be, um, you know, I will hear the dog barking, but it will create a huge error and it will create a large metabolic cost because it's, uh, it's been uh, you know, um, registered at a moment where the, the circuit was not ready for it and was not expecting it. So what it's going to do is that my internal representation of a dog in an auditorium will be updated somehow so that I'm going to expect that when and what kind of barking will happen next. So I'm going to reset the phase of my uh, circuit in the auditory cortex so that I'm going to try as best as I can when and what kind of barking will occur. So that next time, my, at least my metabolic cost will uh, be lower. And I'm going to do that by, for instance, orienting my attention, of course, to what's behind me now. And maybe get more visual input and auditory input so that my internal representation is more accurate. And, but at a very minimalistic level, we think that what's happening is that there is a resetting of the phase of the ongoing oscillation, and that the resetting is induced by beta bursts that help basically the circuit in the primary uh, regions to reset its phase and adjust basically its timing at least, and also maybe other things, so that next time, if I predict correctly, the input is actually happening at a um, level of inhibition that is less, and therefore the regis registration cost is minimized. And if we look at the details, uh, I won't go uh, into them today, unfortunately, but you can also question why there is uh, this little burst locally, and we think that this is a way for the system to adjust and register the timing of the different items that can be uh, input in the system and registered 
In working memory, for instance, you, you may have up to maybe seven cycles for the typical seven objects we can s uh, keep in working memory and order them in time or in, in uh, orders of priorities. So we and others have you know, um, some evidence of that. So I was talking about you know, the evidence of phase amplitude coupling. So yes, the, this time the red curve is blue for some reason, but this is the slow activity I was talking about. E and I are the phases of uh, um, higher and lower relative uh, excitability or inhibition. And instead of having those bursts, fast bursts occurring anywhere, uh, statistically they occur at certain phases. So do we have evidence of that? And the evidence is relatively recent from uh, deep uh, recordings in patients by um, Bob Knight at UC Berkeley, where they have an electrode, they look at basically ongoing activities over minutes without a task, just to look at the you know, elemental aspect of this phase amplitude coupling. And they did find you know, oscillations. So they, they take the trough of the slow oscillation at about four or five hertz at that electrode. They average at the trough systematically and they look over a second and they do find this wavelet and that's normal because the averaging is done on the, on the slow oscillation. But what's more interesting is the time frequency representation of the power of the signal um, over this period of time. And you see there is an alternation of greater fr high frequency power um, at the trough of the oscillation. So that's exactly what we see here. You have more high frequency activity here here than there. And actually, yes, that's exactly what you see here, here, and versus there. At the peak, there is less high frequency power. So this is a, a proof or evidence of a phase amplitude coupling. And we replicated that uh, with MEG non-invasive recording, this time not only at one single site, but across the whole brain. And we did replicate and found that there was phase amplitude coupling indeed across the, the whole human brain during rest and during task. And therefore, we developed a, techno a technique to uh, <coughs> extract and isolate brain networks based on how they align, basically, their statistics of phase amplitude coupling. Because uh, if, we, uh, I mean if we look at the mechanisms behind phase amplitude coupling related to excitability and inhibition, a network could be seen as a set of regions that align, basically, their cycles of net inhibition excitation in time so that they process information together in synchrony. And it can fluctuate, right? So it's a dynamical process. But that's what we did with Esther Florin. And we found so networks that basically align, which is a set of regions with similar phase amplitude coupling statistics. And we did replicate the findings of the resting state networks in fMRI. And if you look at the dynamics of phase amplitude coupling, how it fluctuates in time locally, it fluctuates very much like the fMRI signal. So there is a, a relationship between two different uh, things, very much different things, the direct measurements from electrophysiology and the uh, fluctuations from, uh, of um, blood flow and uh, oxygen uh, fluctuations in fMRI. Um, so we, this is basically the framework we use in the lab for the past uh, five, six years. And we are now bringing more evidence, empirical evidence, to these uh, you know, concepts. And um, so, for instance, it's a recent publication with Soela Sami, who was a grad student in the lab. And we did some also work with Maurice Tito in uh, congenital blindness and somatosensory perception in the absence of, uh, of vision and s demonstrated how the visual system readapts and, and processes somatosensory information on this based on the same principles. Uh, but basically, it's a typical neuropsychology you know, kind of test where you present sequences of five tones, pure tones, and the fourth one, you know that it's a target tone, meaning you have to pay attention to the fourth one. And the task here was to decide whether the pitch of that, uh, the, the deviation of the pitch uh, of that target is uh, zero, meaning it's another standard tone, or it's actually um, a, a different object. And for that, it's exactly you know, what I was trying to describe in my conceptual slide. You have, you know, we expect slow oscillations to be entrained in the, at least in the auditory cortex. And because the target is on the fourth tone, we expect the beta burst 
to actually be uh, greater around the fourth tone, because this is when the phase of the slow oscillation needs to be reset to make sure that the encoding <coughs> comes at with precision, but also minimal uh, metabolic cost, but at least precision. And probably I don't have time to go into the details of the histogram, but that's what we found. There is a sharper you know, occurrence and more precise occurrence of the beta burst, as shown in the histograms, um, around the fourth tone than the other ones, especially uh, the later ones. They are not processed you know, uh, necessarily. Uh, because there is no necessity to the task, but there is a sharpening of the beta occurrence around the target tone. And you can look at uh, you know, uh, what's happening pre-target, so this is in preparation to the occurrence of the tone in question, and that's actually, you see more top-down beta activity from the motor frontal cortex to so higher order brain regions to the auditory regions. And this is true during rest as well. So this is a constituent kind of uh, internal representation of the, you know, how the higher order systems interact with lower systems. And this is also another paper I did with Benjamin Morillon, who works now in Marseille at the um, ENT, I believe. Yes, thank you. Um, where we basically replicated the same uh, uh, approach even, uh, in a more um, sophisticated uh, design. But that's exactly the same. We found higher order brain regions sending beta bursts, you know, in at the proper time, so to speak, with respect to the expected behavior and task completion. So does our brain activity make us unique? That's uh, because we see that, you know, in the task context, uh, yes, there is, uh, it's interesting to see uh, this kind of uh, instantiation or example of the models we were trying to propose. But because we saw that uh, this beta oscillation, which must be you know, very uh, specific to every individual because it's an internal representation, if, if our hypothesis of hierarchical brain networks is somewhat true, somewhat valid, it should be a signal that is distinctive to you know, every individual. So we came up with this idea to replicate some of the early uh, research that has been done in fMRI on brain fingerprinting, meaning that you look at the functional uh, structure of the brain activity, not the anatomy, because the anatomy, or even just looking at a person's face, to some extent, make us unique. But does the brain activity also is unique? And with MEG, we could look at whether certain portions of the brain activity, certain types of uh, um, functional activity and frequency bands make us more unique than others. So. This is some recent work we did with Jason, uh, Jason uh, da Silva Castagnara, who's a grad student in the lab and colleagues. So basically we replicate the approach of uh, what that has been established in fMRI. You have a recording of a certain person and it's just resting state, no task <coughs> on day one. And you bring them back several days later and you question whether the two recordings are similar, right? And for that, we used, we leveraged, uh, you know, some open uh, data repositories like Omega. We used uh, and that we share with everyone, uh, uh, but there are others available these days, which makes it, uh, you know, very exciting for neuroscience in general, these uh, open data repositories. And the average, uh, you know, uh, distance or duration between two subsequent recordings, successive recordings was about 200 days. So almost like a, maybe uh, eight months <coughs> apart. And the uh, recordings, we also wanted to push the envelope by showing that this brain activity, you don't need like 20 minutes of recording or ten, m even 10 minutes like they do in fMRI, but the signature uh, of the brain circuits should be established very quickly. Why not around two minutes, maybe even shorter? So we looked into that as well. And the pipeline is relatively simple. You do the, the source modeling and you extract certain features of the of the person's brain activity. It could be just the power spectrum at different brain regions. You look at interactions between the brain regions like they do in fMRI. You have the, then the different features per participant, and then you have a confusion matrix, and then you extract basically, uh, you look at day one versus day two, and you look at the scoring of individual similarity uh, within the person, between the different persons, and you can establish a form of fingerprinting and also which brain areas 
differentiate people from each other through which channels of communication, which frequency band. Is it the beta band, is it others? So what we found, first of all, we verified that within a session, if you take two snapshots of the brain activity within minutes, just to verify the pipeline or the feasibility of the approach on a simple problem, we were able to differentiate between individuals, and this is what you see here. The different colors don't matter. It's using either spectrum or connectomes as features, but we are close to 95% differentiation, regardless of the frequency band, actually. Maybe with a, a peaks around the alpha and the beta band. Of course, the game is more interesting. If you look at differentiation between sessions, so several months apart, I think the longest duration was three years apart, and the scale is very different. The minimum is 75%. And you see that we actually are able to differentiate between individuals up to 100% or at least above 90% regardless of the features we use. And that actually, uh, you know, the higher frequency bands I was talking about before, the beta, but also the, the gamma, were highly differentiating, especially the beta regardless of the features that you use. And if you look at uh, where in the brain the features are more differentiating, you see that the beta band, for instance, so the brighter the color, the more differentiating between individual it is. So the beta band is definitely the most widespread. It concerns pretty much all the brain. And this is pretty uh, in line with our prediction that this is not only a, a communication channel that is potentially very specific to every individual, but also um, in, I mean, globally present in every brain regions because every brain region receives an input from higher order brain regions in their hierarchy, immediately above or um, you know way above through potentially beta channels. I forgot to mention that we looked at shorter durations of the scan, like only 30% of the of a scan. So, sorry, 30 second of brain activity, so you record activity from somebody's brain from 30 seconds, and you're still able to differentiate between them at about 80% accuracy. So you don't read their names, of course, it's not identification, but you know that this person is the same person that you had seen 200 days before, okay? So that's what it means. And we're starting to look at, uh, you know, uh, Alzheimer's patients, epilepsy patients, because we can map where the brain is actually differentiating itself from a, a healthy sample, for instance, and this is work in progress with Jason and Alex uh, Wiesman in the lab, and so more, more data is coming soon. We are very excited about this approach. We've looked even at the heritability of the brain fingerprints. So we leverage the Human Connectome Project data, where they do have monozygotic or dizygotic twins available. And the idea would be that if some of the, of the uh, identifiable or differentiable features from the brain come from genotypes, then we should be able to use the brain activity of one monozygotic twin and be able to show that it's very similar to that of his twin brother or sister. Whereas if you look at you know, uh, unrelated persons, then uh, you would be unable to establish a link between the two or even dizygotic twins, you shouldn't be able to, because they don't share, you know, close to 100% of their genotype, they should, it should be, we should we need to finish? You're running out of time. Oh, I'm so sorry, yes, it's 10.30. Um, so I'm going to be finished after that, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so that's what we tested. So we looked at, you know, individual differentiation. Yeah, so that's around here, that's the purple dashed line, so you can, we replicated basically uh, our previous finding uh, from a completely different cohort and a different scanner technology, by the way, <coughs> showing that it's robust. And then we took monozygotic pairs and we uh, verified that by taking the scan of um, uh, twin number one in the pair, we were able to match it to that of twin number two with relatively high confidence. You know, we look at, uh, I think, um, a a cohort of about 50 um, monozygotic twins and uh, um, controls, and you see that you can differentiate uh, or you can associate the mono monozygotic twins much better than with greater confidence than even dizygotic uh, pairs. Okay, so I'm going to finish um, here. 
I'm going to skip a few slides, I'm sorry. I'd just like to show, um, if I can take two minutes to show examples of decoding to bring back to AI, how we leverage these findings for, for AI. So first of all, uh, for instance, when you play an audio stream to someone, like a speech or a piece of music, uh, a beautiful property of the brain is that at least some of the brain networks will be untrained by the acoustic features of the stream. So it could be the amplitude, it could be somewhat the pitch. And so what we did with speech is that indeed you can decode uh, the speech content uh, from uh, the brain. And when you look at where it maps, so it maps to uh, the uh, language network, so not only the auditory uh, brain regions, but also the other brain areas that tend to be, that are involved in language processing, essentially, I mean, uh, for as we know it today, and um, are untrained by the, by the, the speech content. And so you can, you can actually, this is work by uh, Jean-Rémy King, who is now, uh, I think he was with, uh, he was Stan Dehan uh, when he did his uh, PhD thesis at uh, Neurospin, and now he's a researcher at uh, Meta AI. So what they did is uh, beyond, you know, uh, is basically try to decode the, the, the content of the speech. So what I was showing in the previous slide is that when you present speech to someone, the brain activity will respond and will be untrained to that speech. And now you can also decode the, the content of what the person is listening to just from the brain activity. So this is done non-invasively with MEG. And this is a recent paper that has expanded the approach with uh, music. And I don't know if you saw in the press, but they presented a song by Pink Floyd and they were able to decode the, to some extent the content of the song. I think I have an example here, but I will skip it. So this is the music piece decoded from the brain signals. It doesn't sound like much, but if you know the original tune, that's the original tune. So it's a very mellow and variation of a piece from Pink Floyd. Um, I'd like to finish with decoding of uh, vision, and I promise I'm done after that. So remember, I was dreaming, uh, you know, standing before you, that we could decode the content of brain activity millisecond by millisecond. So this is leveraging, uh, you know, decoding uh, machine learning with machine learning. And so you present thousands and thousands of images to somebody, and then you train the system to learn what the, the person has been looking at, and you can then ask questions whether we can discriminate whether the person has looked at body fa bodies, body parts, faces, or inanimate objects. And yes, you can decode beyond chance very early after the onset of the image, 160 milliseconds after. You can even uh, you know, ask the decoder whether the person has looked at uh, something natural versus artificial. And you can indeed decode what the person has seen. So it's a form of mind reading, if you will, with a trained agent. And the same team at Meta AI is now uh, looking at decoding of um, you know, images, image content. So this is a cool movie where in fMRI, where you show a train, and from the brain signals, the system is actually decoding the content itself. So it's not even the category, but it's actually the content. So it's quite uh, impressive that this is using fMRI, so it's static. You show an image of what? A zebra? and it found something that, oh yeah, you've looked at a zebra in your brain. But what they did just recently is that you can do it with MEG, so millisecond by millisecond, the system is trying to match basically what the person is looking at, or guess what the person is looking at. Maybe this has just good examples, but this is pretty telling that this is actually uh, something that is doable. So it's more like a technical tour de force today, but we, you could think as you know, probing a person's uh, you know, perception, integrity of visual perception, auditory perception, people in uh, different states of coma or minimally uh, conscious or altered uh, states of consciousness and be able to, you know, assess more objectively the integrity of their perception. So I will stop here with a word of conclusion. So if we can take away anything, hopefully, uh, so the brain is not exactly a computer, so there is a distinction between, many distinctions between artificial and biological cognition, and, 
and, um, and intelligence, and uh, that starts with the, uh, the body and uh, the fact that our intelligence is embodied. And we constantly try to align our predictions about what's going to happen to us with how we, uh, what is actually happening. This is how we learn, this is how we adapt, this is how we change our environment. Uh, I think I try to advocate for using or combining your imaging technologies with uh, human electrophysiology uh, to gain insight about the mechanisms and the timings. And I will stop there. This is just a plug for the uh, toolbox that we develop, uh, the brainstorm toolbox, the data sets we share. Please use it if you do electrophysiology, uh, EEG, MEG, or even single units. I would like to thank my lab. And thank you all for your patience and attention. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvain, for this very interesting uh, review 